Uh, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, today's talk will be uh, maybe a continuation of something I started last year at Demaxed, uh, uh, trying to give historical uh, retrospective of some key ideas and techniques uh, that uh, we're all enjoying these days in video and video coding specifically. So today I'll focus on video codecs. And as I will focus on video codecs, first thing that I will bring is uh, just notion of some modern video codecs. And uh, please don't read in small text here. The intent here is just to show that there are many small details. But in principle, all these codecs are very similar. They all use some and the same fundamental building blocks. They use transforms, they use predictors, they use scan orders, quantizers, filters, entropy coding, and so on. And the key question is uh, how we end up with uh, this particular mix of these techniques and what all those techniques were built for to begin with and what even enabled us to think about building those techniques. So with this, uh, let me start with probably most fundamental invention that was ever made in anything that relates to digital uh, uh, and signal processing. And that is invention of Fourier transform. Fourier in 1822 published a tract which was called Analytical Theory of Heat, where in one uh, particular chapter he uh, looked at many examples and conjectured that uh, uh, a function, and he said that arbitrary function, he didn't prove it, but he conjectured that arbitrary function could potentially be decomposed as a series of signs of multiples of the uh, same argument. And of course, uh, uh, thanks to efforts of many generations of mathematicians later on, we now know that, uh, yes, it does indeed possible to uh, produce such decompositions. In general case, they are not exactly sums, they are integrals. So the function needs to satisfy particular conditions, Dirichlet conditions, and so on. But in special cases, when those signals are periodic, they do indeed have a, a series of sums, and, uh, and the spectrum become discrete, and uh, it's a fundamental instrument that we are using everywhere today to think about signals. But now, uh, by itself, uh, it didn't yet enable practical applications. Why? Because if you think about arbitrary function, and it, it could produce infinite spectrum. And if spectrum is infinite, what do you do? You cannot transmit it. You need infinite bandwidth to transmit it. So the next fundamental idea that came uh, along with it was, why wouldn't we force uh, the signals to stay within certain bands, this concept of band-limited signals? And, and of course, uh, uh, if uh, original signal is not uh, band-limited, let's think that it is band-limited. If it's an audio signal, uh, let's think that we don't hear anything beyond 20 kilohertz, uh, which if you're old enough, you probably, you surely don't hear. Uh, then let's let's just uh, you know filter it out and uh, force it to, to stay within that band and then work with it. And what coincidentally this also yielded is another very important uh, observation. And uh, credits go to Whitaker, 1915, Nyquist, uh, Katelnikov, 33, Shannon, 49, who uh, established that if signal is band limited. Turns out you don't even need to see it in analog form. You don't need to see it everywhere. It's sufficient to observe it at discrete set of points, a certain sampling interval, and that by itself is sufficient to reconstruct it entirety, entirely. And that is a so called famous sampling theorem with all this famous folks being uh, uh, proudly responsible for this accomplishment. Of course, if signal can be observed in a discrete set of samples. Now we can work with it as discrete systems. Everything we know today, pixels, uh, audio samples, these are examples of discrete, uh, discreetly presented signals. Now, when we start talking about images, there is another caveat, which if you think about a Fourier transform, it works wonderfully if a signal is zero mean and fluctuating because sines and cosines are zero mean fluctuating. You have perfect convergence and all harmonics are useful. But what if signal is non-negative? For example, images, light, optical signals. There is no such thing as negative black, right? It stays at zero, right? 
uh, it turns out you could still use Fourier transform, but it's not effective anymore uh, to the same extent as it was before. Why? Because your amplitudes of spectra is decaying. And there is a famous bound, it's typically called Lucas bound, even though Bock and, and Katz invented it a bit earlier. And uh, it, it gives this uh, bound of spectra of uh, arbitrary non-negative signals. Why this is important? And, uh, who figured out how to use it? It was Andy Tesher, 1973, it was his PhD thesis. What he did is he looked at a uh, spectrum in one dimension, then he looked in two-dimensional signals, said, okay, well, this looks like a, uh, now a surface that is progressively decaying, and now if I'm about to code amplitudes of a spectra, and I want to predict adjacent one, I need to walk along this curve such that energies are progressively decaying. And how I can walk along the surface such that I have uh, this monotonic decay of uh, intensities? Well, it turns out that was this zigzag scan. It was invented before DCTs were around. It was invented for the purpose of coding of amplitudes of Fourier transform, 1973. And uh, now, before we jump to DCTs, there was another important concept that came around independently, and by the way, it's known in different fields as Eigen transform, Hetelling transform, and uh, PCA, so-called principal component analysis technique, is closely related. What is this? It's basically a concept of how to take an arbitrary discrete now signals and finite signals of n samples and transform it to another signal x to y such that the correlation of this transform signal is now diagonal, forms diagonal matrix. Why would you want to have correlation diagonal? Because then you reduce stochastic complexity. Instead of working with two-dimensional signal, this, uh, this uh, signal that has n potentially order of n memory, you work with just n uh, memoryless elements. You could quantize each of these uh, diagonal elements and encode separately. So dramatic reduction in in uh, like uh, problem. And uh, in a special case, one signal is a so-called Markov one signal. So what is this? Is this one each next uh, sample can be presented as a product of previous sample by certain parameter rho plus uh, residual noise. Uh, so for case of this uh, type of signal, uh, turns out that uh, KLT has a very nice uh, analytical formulation, but except that you need to still find roots there and uh, you still need to use some numerical techniques, but you at least can compute it. For more complex cases, you don't have it, and uh, another uh, bad thing about it, it depends on signal. For each signal, it will be different. So it's not uh, immediately usable for compression as such, or simply usable for compression as such, but it gives a super important analytical tool. And why this is important? Because first paper on DCT by Ahmed, Natarjan, and Rao, uh, I was curious uh, what motivated uh, these inventors with DCT. And the paper starts with definition. This is what DCT is. And later they say, by the way, this thing now matches very closely to KLT for Markov 1 signal. How they establish this match is not clear from the paper. They present result and then they say that this is, uh, this is why it's good. Well, it took about seven years more when Clark actually proved that there is a very uh, strong relationship. It's a, a limit case when rho is approaching one, and there are several other limit cases. But the uh, point is uh, that uh, DCT was, in fact, created as a simplification of uh, KLT for a specific type of process, and this is why... Uh, uh, this was motivated them. It, it's used these days everywhere in algorithms. Why it's good? Because it doesn't depend on the signal. It could be computed with uh, uh, relatively simple operations. It allows fast uh, algorithms and so on and so forth. Used everywhere, most celebrated transforms out there. But this is not the only DCT type transforms or sign transform of its kind. Turns out, uh, by the way, it's typically called DCT type 2, and there is a reason why it's called DCT type 2, because there is about seven other types of DCTs. And uh, uh, the other transform uh, that is used very extensively in uh, video coding is called DST type 7. It is uh, very similar to DCT type 2 in derivation, except that uh, 
what is stated is that what if we know the boundary condition for a signal? Why, why this is important is because when we compress videos, we sometimes progress video by chopping them in blocks, and then we know what was the values of previous blocks that we just encoded. So we know the boundary conditions, and if we know the boundary conditions and we run all the mathematics, well, it turns out the KLT for same process with this known boundary is now a different transform. And this transform is DST type 7. So it's uh, another transform. Uh, credit for this goes to uh, uh, actually several authors, Han, Ankur Saxena, and Ken Raze from University of Santa Barbara published a paper that uh, suggested using this transform for video coding. Ankur did uh, pretty heavy lifting to actually make it adapted in HEVC. And of course, we use, see this transform used in many other codecs today. And, uh, but again, motivation was KLT for a particular process. And, and, and then it uh, turns out that there are about uh, eight different kinds of transforms. And, uh, and uh, if there are DCT transforms and same kinds of DSTs, and it turns out that many of them are used these days. Many of them are cross-related. Many of them could be derived as special cases of KLT to some processes with some boundary conditions. But the good news is that they all uh, allow fast recursive computation. Of course, if we have dyadic transform sizes, then what is shown on the left is a very well-known smith fralick decomposition. What is shown on the left is a little bit more uh, twisted decomposition for DST type 7, DCT type 6 transforms. Uh, I actually happen to be the author of that. Uh, if you will remember me for anything, please remember me for that uh, uh, formula. Uh, but the uh, uh, point is all these transforms are used. Modern codecs are used as transforms and permutations. They just use uh, decision mode. And they try usually at encoder level all these different transforms, and they, they pick the ones that works best. And what is my uh, view on all of this in the future? Of course, this transforms, as you just seen, have a very beautiful mathematical background and reasoning for existence. Uh, but uh, I somehow feel that in the future, we probably will see just uh, empirically trained irregular transforms produced by deep learning and other algorithms. And uh, with existing techniques and GPUs, that seems simpler. And you don't need to study math to, to be able to do it. Uh, fast algorithms probably will still exist, uh, but probably the biggest argument for this will be is that they are fast. And uh, that's uh, the, the last uh, uh, kind of argument here. Uh, last slide, I want to just uh, briefly show history of how uh, like uh, adoption of uh, transforms and other techniques happened. When we think about video codecs, we think that you know, HEVC was developed around 2010, 2020, right? You know, VVC is also a very new invention. Well, turns out first transform-based codecs were known since 1969. It was uh, Walsh Hadamard, Transform Pratt, and Andrew, Andrews uh, were uh, like uh, early pioneers in that area. They suggested how to build codec uh, based on this. Uh, Fourier-based transforms, uh, the dissertation of Andy Trescher that I was talking about was one of them. Even before Andy, uh, Habibi, and uh, Wint uh, uh, had uh, their own study on same kind. Uh, with DCT, when, with the arrival of DCT type 2, so this whole chain of uh, codecs uh, produced very quickly. Chen Smith Fralick was, uh, Chen and Smith codec was uh, one of the early designs, 1976. Uh, uh, Camarar and Rao in 1801. Uh, Compression Labs uh, was a very successful company for a while doing first uh, uh, video conferencing system. 1982 was their commercial system based on DCT. It was decades before JPEG and uh, all, 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 all the MPEGs and so on. Now, of course, uh, transforms by themselves don't uh, compose a full set of tools. There are also prediction tools. And uh, fundamentally, concept of prediction could be traced to delta modulation, DPCM, uh, Cutler's idea of 1950s. Uh, first, uh, DPCM-based and TSC codecs uh, were known since 80s. Uh, Atul uh, Natravali, Arun Natravali, and his team at at and was uh, producing a number of prototypes of such. Uh, uh, first, uh, 
experiments with interframe coding didn't happen since MPEG or H261 or H263. There was uh, uh, standard code H120. And uh, first attempts to code pictures was not by coding uh, prediction from one picture but to another. So it was a technique called conditional replenishment where some subset of macro blocks were progressively replaced from one frame to another based on the residual energy. Of course, later they changed it to another technique called frame difference coding, 1988, and only since about 89, first uh, uh, algorithms with motion-based compensation came around. Uh, CCIR uh, 721 and CCIR 723 were the first algorithms of this kind. And uh, with bidirectional prediction, B frames, uh, also, this history is funny. In 1986, it was a master thesis dissertation of uh, Thomas Mackey at the University of Hanover. And uh, that, uh, by the way, the fact that uh, he invented it came not a couple years ago in one of the lawsuits. Uh, apparently, there was a very good uh, technical expert who managed to find that single copy of this uh, single thesis that was uh, locked in the university library. But they discovered it, and now we know that uh, the origins. Uh, of course, Satu Puri, uh, Barry Haskell, and others at AT&T were working on this in the 1990s. MPEG-1 was first system. And GOPS was probably the most uh, uh, big, unique contribution of MPEG-1 in a concept of uh, system-level concepts that we still use today. So with this, I uh, uh, hope this was uh, refreshing. and. Uh, uh, kind of uh, nostalgic uh, look back in history and thank you very much.